Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Quest for the Best Director Podcast, also known as the Greatest Movie Director Ever Bracket Podcast, also known as um, a podcast where we tackle some problematic movies in an even more problematic fashion. I'm your host, <laughs> Matthew Moore, and joining me is a guy who often gets confused for a priest as well, even though he really just uh, sells beer. Caleb Ferguson. Caleb, what's going on? Hey, Matthew. I am very excited to talk about these two movies. I, I think am, too. These are, these are our first Tier 4 movies, uh-huh. and uh, you can tell. Yeah, actually, it seems to be a giant jump, in my opinion, from like this and the average um, you know, Tier 5 movie, I guess. Although, to be fair, we did drop down to Tier 6 movies before coming up. That's true. So it's like often, those were more pretty comparable to Tier 5. Yeah. Now, also joining us, Caleb, is a guy who wears gloves just to make sure that he doesn't get AIDS. Derek Schwarzinski. Derek, how's it going? Pretty all right. That was a quote from Hannah and her sisters, by the way, the wears gloves so they don't get AIDS thing. It wasn't like that racist. Just to clarify. Yeah, I, I got it. It's all right. Um, I won't uh, judge you for, uh, you know whatever problematic things occur <laughs> in a novel or a movie that you quote. Yeah. Um, well, that wasn't actually the problematic. Well, I'll just say that, um, <clears throat> yeah, both of these movies have very different um, social problems that we're going to have to address, I would say. But um, that said, this is the question for the Best Director podcast. It is, as Kip said, the first of our Tier 4 movies are... Each, we're, each week we go through two directors' movies, and this is each of the directors' fourth best movies. This week it's Woody Allen versus John Ford, Hannah and her sisters versus Stagecoach. So, guys, uh, first, yeah, I kind of want like, to what Caleb's saying, which was, these were some really good movies, huh? Mm-hmm. I would say by pair. far the best pair we've had so far. The best uh, pair. Let's see. Maybe. Let me think. Uh, At the very probably, least, they're both yeah, very strong. Yeah, probably the best pair, yeah. I think that's fair to say. Actually, let me think. Yeah, the best pair. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's fair. I was going to say the Cries and Whispers <laughs> and Tree to Shame was also really good. Um, and uh, Monsieur Vado is Faust. Actually, yeah, I take that back. I think Monsieur Vado Faust was stronger. I might agree with that as well in our list i don't know i would have probably both of these movies in my top five if we were to like put these in with our you know other rankings i have probably both in my top five i would definitely have one of these movies in my top five i don't know about both i'm curious uh, to find out which one that is yeah me too i guess you it will seems find you'll like these more than i thought did you not not top five level no Actually, let me see, let me see my top five. I already five. know what Derek likes, so I hope it's not the same one that Caleb likes. This is gonna be a boring podcast. I am, yeah. Actually, wait. How do you know which one Derek likes? Because he understands Derek. the kind of person I am. Derek I'm a fairly likes. straightforward person. That's true. Nobody's gonna like. Oh, wait, neither of these movies have Japanese people in them. <laughs> yeah, but one of them has is like the genre that's like you know basically the samurai movie, so that kind of counts. That's true. <laughs> All right. I really yeah. don't oh, like no. being pigeonholed. First? I do not enjoy being pigeonholed. Oh, <laughs> Stop jumping in the pigeonhole, dude. I'm not jumping in the hit- pigeonhole. Y'all are creating it around me for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't I like just... Japanese movies just because they're Japanese. And I kind of, re- I very much resent that being said. Like, very well, Caleb, much. You weren't, um, you weren't here on uh, Discord yesterday when we were just chatting it up. But um, I made the claim that Oh, there's been a positive correlation between ratings and um, Derek getting angry, so we actually have to get <laughs> every episode for the ratings now. So I'm All glad right. we've already met that quota at least. Yeah. Now we can really have serious film discussion. So which one do you want to talk about first? Let's talk about Stagecoach since we kind of already mentioned that movie. Sure, Stagecoach. The I would say the seminal to you know use the word that my friend Caleb Ferguson used earlier today with me. 
a seminal western movie. I think that's fair. Uh, I think that's mm. fair. I actually would disagree. Kind of. Well, maybe not. Uh, the seminal. Actually, yeah, it it it's definitely the seminal. This is like the OG western. This is like yeah, what, it's the first great one, right? This is the first great western for sure. No, but see, okay, I disagree, and I think if you create we, Matthew and I were kind of talking about this earlier, but like to be a, like at the center of what a genre is, it has to be all about like it's how it subverts the tropes and basically messes with your expectations of what that genre is. But if you create all of those tropes and expectations, you can't be a genre film. Except so, for that goes against what a genre is. That's literally what the genre is is the tropes. So, so by making the greatest the or the like center or the seminal or the seminal is different from being the center. That's also different. Two different things. But being at the center is is uh, being the seminal is literally just being what everything else is developed off of. Is that what seminal means, though? Yes. That's literally what the word means. Because I, I think we probably have a similar opinion on this movie. I was just considering seminal to be, like, the center. No, seminal literally means, like, the with the greatest influence or, like, the or like greatest oh, precursor. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right, because it means strongly influencing later developments. So, yeah, by that definition, it is definitely the seminal uh, Western movie. So, I changed my opinion. But it's not the center of Westerns. Because I think, like, a true Western movie would be more about, like, subverting our expectations of what a Western is or, like, playing with the tropes. I don't uh, necessarily I agree. Sense. I don't think that uh, is a requirement to be, say, the greatest. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, when I watched it, though, I felt more like um, I wasn't really watching a Western. I was just watching a drama that was, like, set in the West, if that makes sense. Yeah, and... I think a lot of the great westerns are like that, right? So let's get into that. Why do you say like this wasn't a western? Because I think that's like, an important kind of discussion. Um, I think see. the that's goes in kind of the trope of a western is kind of the idea of like these domestic people needing saviors, a uh, savior of some kind, and that being kind of like an anti-hero, like lone wolf coming to save the day. What uh, against whatever that is? Maybe it's Indians. If it's more, uh, set in like I don't know. For the example, the Searchers, it's John Wayne being like the savior from the Indians using his like racist violence and exploring the ideas of that and like so it, that's the kind of the trope of a western is like. But there's no really like uh, uh <laughs> there's no. The uh, Indians and the stagecoach are very much barely there for mu- much of it, and are or uh, aren't much of a threat realistically in like the overall narrative sense. Yeah, that's a good um, analysis of it too. I think also part of it, uh, for me at least, was sort of like in kind of in general, it didn't feel that like gritty or like realistic. Which to me, like, is sort of how Western feels. It kind of felt more like a, it was on stage or something almost. Like everything was kind of like very like simple and stripped back. Would you guys agree with that? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's largely the effect that he wanted. Um, Mm -hmm. Is, I think that's what he was. Um, like much of what he was trying to achieve is like, uh, kind of a play. and more of interested in the characters rather than like say the setting i guess right the, yeah the actual setting maybe that's like the kind of a good way of putting it then is that like a true genre western is about the west it's about the setting whereas okay. this is like not about the setting it's just about the people no i disagree though with uh, that claim i think this is definitely about the west i think we're getting confused is it's just not about it was the Wild West, you know? Yeah. Because in the Western film, the, all the great Western films, like all the great samurai films, do not take place in the heyday of the Wild West, right? That's the whole thing, is like everything's settling down, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, I think this movie is 
we're literally seeing like the settling down. You know, I mean, yes, we do have this obviously great scene at the end with the um, you know, with the Native Americans, you know, and the whole yeah, shootout and stuff. But the majority of this movie is, as we established, in a stagecoach, just calm, relaxed, or big bag outlaw. I mean, more or less gives himself up. <laughs> I guess we can talk about that later. But yeah, I think you no, know, he escapes, right? He doesn't give himself. Well, yeah, up. he he will. I mean, initially. At the initial I mean, uh, beginning, he so literally nice, just gives up. Yeah. yeah, he literally like he just like walks up, you know, pulls up. And then he like, gets a gun pointed at him, so you can kind of argue. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I think it's still about the West, right? And it's like, definitely a commentary on the West. It's just a uh, different sort of comment. It's an actual commentary and not just like this. Yeah, real. That's why Geronimo is probably used, is because, like, at this point, re- uh, really, Indians aren't, like, going around and headhunting anymore like they are in, like, Texas. Like, the Apaches were, like, just straight-up raiding all throughout Texas, like, in the actual Wild West. At this point, pretty much all the Indians have been forced onto reservations, and Geronimo is, like, probably the last, like, struggling and, like, escaping the reservation to actually attempt anything, really. So that was probably why Geronimo was picked for that. Um, That's a really good call, Derek. I like it. Um, now, one kind of interesting thing historically about this movie is <clears throat> it's really the first big John Wayne movie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I was trying to figure that out because have you guys ever seen any John Wayne movies before Stagecoach? Yeah, my grandfather is probably the biggest John Wayne fan you'll ever meet in your life. Oh, really? Yeah. So I've only ever seen one, which was called, um, oh, what's it called? I just I had it up because I knew I'd forget what it was called. Uh, Coincidentally enough, I believe this is my grandfather's favorite John Wayne film. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people's, right? Um... But yeah, it, it was called Two Fits of Law, and I didn't think it was that different <laughs> from like you know, this iteration. I mean, at least like how he is presented, right? I mean, the actual writing of it's definitely different. But you know, I think to the public eye, who's not really catching all of that, it's still a very similar character. I'm trying to figure out what is it about this movie that kind of really began the myth of John Wayne. Hmm. What do you guys think? Because, uh, like classically. John Wayne is um, kind of anti-authority, but still, like, not in the destructive way of, like, the usual antagonist he faces, which is also kind of like a Western trope, is that, like, the anti-hero is against authority, but his antagonist, like, maybe it's, like, some random dude going around killing people, uh, it's kind of, like, anti-authority as well, and it's di- dynamic. This is, like, the first start to that. This is the beginning of John Wayne kind of being so likable that even, like, the lawman uh, is willing to, like, just let him go. And consequently, the audience is kind of, like, alongside these people that are just attracted to John Wayne's, like, I guess, charisma, I suppose. Yeah. With, like, Uh, Dallas and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Although it's kind of ironic, right, because... Although, you know, it's, once again, the kind of the beginning of John Wayne's stardom, he's definitely not the best actor in this movie. Oh, yeah. Definitely yeah. not even close, yeah. right? Like, John Carradine was killing it. That's what um, I was going to say. Who was that? Oh, that was... Um, Hatfield. Yeah, Hatfield. And then also, I think Thomas Mitchell wins an Oscar for this movie. Yeah, Tom- Thomas so, like, Mitchell. Oh, my, a, I was so impressed. We saw him in... Um, only Angels Have Wings. Um, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he was in Only Angels Have Wings, and he's in It's a Wonderful Life. So I was like, is this the... It's a, this is when I realized, I was like, oh, this is the It's a Wonderful Life dude. And it's like, oh, this is also the dude from Only Have, Angels Have Wings. Holy crap, he's... Like, he was good in that, and he's amazing in this. Yeah. Like, Definitely a lot of um, actors that we know in these two movies, huh? We'll get to... <laughs> oh yeah, John Carradine in um he was in Grapes of Wrath as well. He was the preacher mm-hmm. and he killed it in that. So I was like, Oh, this has John Carradine. Let me see what he does. Oh my god, he's actually really good. And then of course we'll get to Hannah Sisters, which is like 
five different like yeah famous. that's just super famous on super famous <laughs> yeah just like julie louis dreyfus is just, like casually in the background of that movie <laughs> Wait, really? i didn't even catch that that's hilarious you didn't oh yeah no. there's like several times yeah yeah we'll, we'll get that's to that funny. Later. um she's like uh one of his assistants one of <laughs> woody allen's character's assistant yeah is it i wonder i guess around then is like when she started like after or before that she was like saturday night live and then like this was like around when she started seinfeld a bit before but yeah but anyways <laughs> if i get distracted stagecoach yeah but i think also like the ending definitely affects how he is viewed right where he like literally goes off into the sunset with a girl oh yeah <laughs> oh yep and it's also yeah. interesting this is kind of like mm. a historical tidbit but they're leaving for mexico at this point like this is like after the like civil war like revolution in mexico like almost actually this might be like right after i think it was like 1870s so um kind of interesting uh that after all like because after the revolution like all the indians like that were running wild yeah, on like there. were like not there anymore oh really like because during like the revolution indians were like rampant in the north of mexico like just master, like, mass killings in, like, the north of Mexico. So, it's kind of interesting. It is uh, interesting. So, you think, like, Mexico had settled down as well by that point? So, he's not even really running into the wild. He's kind of running. Yeah, he's, he's uh, not running into the wild anymore. That's why it's, like, so important that he has a house there. Or, like, a mm -hmm. ranch there. Because, like, that's safety for him. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So, we're kind of talking about the end, but let's go back to the beginning. Because I think this beginning is super important. Because the beginning really just throws you into the movie. And I remember yeah. when I watched this all those years ago. I think it was like three years ago at this point. I felt the same thing. Like, what what is happening in this movie? And now I have yeah. the advantage of like having Honestly, seen it a couple times. Honestly, I, I really, really like the beginning a lot. Because it was... What I dislike is beginnings that take way too long. And I, I can, like, see, like, little in inefficiencies. This beginning was, like, super just efficient. Like, we get the beginning with, like, the, I believe... The, I don't remember his designation, but I think it was lieutenant. Um, like just coming in, like saying, "Yeah, Geronimo's coming." And it's like, mm -hmm. "Oh, okay," and it just immediately cuts to the town, and then like we see Dallas getting driven out because she's a prostitute, and it's like, and that's when I was like, "Okay, I get this." And then the shot when the uh, Doc Boone comes in, Thomas Mitchell, it's mm -hmm. like he comes in off. We kind of see him come off from like the building next to it, so we get a perspective of where he was, and then he goes towards the saloon across the street, and we get the perspective from the saloon in the doorway back, so we can see the door of the saloon. I was like, so you get the relative position of the saloon next to, uh, with the building that he came from initially, and where Dallas is still. So when he leaves the booth, and you can tell where he's going as well, back to Dallas. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it also that seems hysterical too, right? Yeah, the just... Doc Boone. There's like the really ham music as he's marching. Yeah, like, to the guillotine, and then so, <laughs> the, oh my gosh, it was one of the funniest little like <laughs> little jokes. He goes like to the guillotine. And they have like the really hammy music, but you can also hear in the background. So the woman's like, "Give me a sec, I'll be right there." Like I guess she's coming. She's like, "I have to get something," but it was just so funny. <laughs> it's just right after he says it's to the guillotine. <laughs> so also... it sounds like someone like one of the background characters is like really excited to go to the also, guillotine. Yeah. Also the inch, uh, the intro of uh samuel peacock the whiskey salesman that everyone just considers mm -hmm. uh, thinks he's a clergyman because of how he looks yeah. and they call him <laughs> the wrong name always <laughs> hancock <laughs> uh also oh, buck, that guy is great yeah that I, guy and buck are hilarious mm -hmm. oh buck is so funny too yeah is he anything i don't know uh i looked him up he's andy devine i haven't heard of him but apparently he's in the man who shot uh liberty valence that's definitely where i've seen him from yeah i know who oh, I, I, I can picture him in that movie too yeah that also has john carradine is, and john and, wayne yeah. and also once again it's another movie where john wayne is, is the main star but is definitely not the best actor <laughs> <laughs> apparently he was in a star is born oh my god i didn't know that john wayne no, um, Andy De Devine, uh, Devine. I was like, I don't think John Wayne is in the Star is Born. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I, I, would, I would definitely know that. John Wayne, yeah. Dude. And it's funny because, like, like we're saying, like, 
I think John Carradine's probably the second like most famous actor in this movie, right? And he still doesn't he also doesn't have the best performance. And once again, like the man shot at Liberty Valance, James Stewart, like, is definitely not the best actor in that either. It's uh probably like Lee Marvin. It's really funny how John Mahan's effects where he kind of just brings everyone down with him. <laughs> <laughs> and then like just the randoms rise up. But uh yeah, anyways, the beginning of the movie. Caleb, you said you, you did not seem as high on it. What's up? Oh, the beginning? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I th- I agree that it, that's a really efficient job of, like, um, introducing all their stories and stuff. But for me, just in general, I was, like, so unable to, like, follow all the random narrative strings that were going on in this mm-hmm. movie. So, like, I pretty much just tuned them out, which, I don't know, maybe, like, you're just supposed to ignore all the random tidbits they're throwing at you. But, um. Yeah, I found it, like, at least the way I found this movie rewarding was just, like, focus on, like, the relationships between all these people and pretty much, like, ignore yeah. everything about the actual narrative. So I don't know if that's the way you're supposed to do it, but that's the way I did it. I don't I think know. it's pretty solid. Yeah, uh, I think um, in the case of Dallas, it was intentionally that way because it's kind of, like, the audience is supposed to be, like, figure out why he's getting driven out as, like, uh, John Wayne's character fil- figures out, and it's kind of like the dynamic of everyone else and John Wayne not knowing that's uh, interesting on that storyline and I would say um, it's kind of like on the nose with uh, well not that's kind of harsh but um, with I forget her name um, the other lady in the page yeah well, for some reason I did not write down her name I wrote down Lucy Mallory everyone else's name. yeah is that her name Lucy is her name in, in oh the, yeah it's in, Mallory's last name yeah, yeah Mallory um, yeah her reason's kind of like I'm going with my to find my husband who's in battle, yeah, so I gotta go with him. Much, that's pretty much said. The weird one is Hatfield, right? Yeah, Hatfield. You're like, who? What is this guy doing? <laughs> like, who is he? I was I was very confused about the whole Hatfield thing for a while. Um, yeah, but that, so you kind of realize that he recognizes her, uh, like, because that's like that storyline. It's like I think supposed to be confusing. It's like, why is this guy doing it? And then his yeah. reveal is that he's like, um, I forget. He's like. The judge's uh, son in Virginia, um, and she's like, uh, "You are on so and so's. Uh, you're that's so and so's crest." And he's like, "Oh, I just wanted in a bet." And then at the end, he's like, "Tell my father, judge. I don't know whatever his name is. Um, Gate. Uh, is it Gatewood? No, I don't remember." Um, Derek was fine. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like the reveal is again. It's kind of like as the story progresses that you can and like they interact with one another. It kind of like you realize that like why people don't like him too, or he shot somebody in the back. Yeah, and it's kind of like organically uh, revealing things. Now I agree with that. Although sometimes I feel like John Wayne's direction doesn't always reflect that, right? Where because his the way he shoots things, like you've kind of said, because it's efficiency. It's like a very matter of factness about it. Mm -hmm. Right. It was all about kind of the perfect shot. You know, that's kind of what he's known for. Um, just being able to, like, shoot better than pretty much anyone. You know, it comes, like, um, how to fr- frame better than he almost knows. So, mm-hmm. Good at that, too, I guess. Um, so I think once you have like, these very confusing narratives, sometimes it's like, nice to let your audience know that, like, they're not supposed to understand everything because I think it's kind of disengages audiences when they feel like they're just, like, not quite getting the movie instead of, like, it's an intentional mystery. You know, yeah. there's a fine line there. I think, uh, the ex- I think the kind of expectations is that you kind of understand like the basics of what is driving them at the beginning. That's why it's so efficient. Is that you kind of just you understand what's driving them to get on the stagecoach in general, like why they're even on the stagecoach, and then you kind of from there organically develop it through like just interactions and whatnot. So, like, once again, I agree, and, like, as the movie progresses, it kind of makes sense, but I'm just saying, in the beginning, I th- could see how it could, like, discourage, disengage a lot of people, you know? And as we talk about, like, these, like, top-tier movies, I think it's important to, like, point out stuff like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, then we kind of get, like, a lot of, kind of, different scenes. Um, which one stood out to you in this kind of middle portion of the film, like, once they kind of get onto the stagecoach? Ooh. Which you know, can include all the scenes in the stagecoach itself, I guess. Which is something to talk about. I really like the one where um, he gives the water to the lady and he has the cup, but then like he doesn't give the cup to the other girl. And like mm-hmm. I don't know, there's like all these like there's a lot of scenes that are kind of like this in the movie where they are like very slow and deliberately 
pace, relatively subtle actions will illuminate like the relationships between all these like people. And he really like John Ford like lets these scenes like really take their time and almost kind of like drag on, but like in a really effective way to like really ratchet up the tension and like give full detail and life to these like relationships. It's interesting that you talk about that scene because that's kind of like uh, another step in like establishing that he's like a gentleman and, yeah. like, and it's like he gives the cup to the lady to make sure that she doesn't drink from uh, the canteen that everyone else is putting their dirty mouth on. And then he just like, eh, it's fine enough for the non lady to uh, drink from the canteen. Kind of like <laughs> what, I, the, what I loved about his character in general is that like he kind of like uh, that's sort of like an unexpected thing, right? Because just based on like his character design, like you expect him to be like an antagonist, like dastardly type character, but he's also like he's also a gentleman at the same time. So it's kind of like subversive expectation there. Well, he want, but I think. It's kind of I agree, but I think it's even more where it's like um it's not just a version of expectation, but it's like how the world perceives him, right? Because the world doesn't perceive him as a gentleman. You know? Yeah. They perceive him as this traitor, this kind of scum. So yeah, it's like this intentional thing, right? Where that's how he is on the outside, but how he really is on the inside, you know, it's like that kind of mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I think also just this scenes within the stagecoach are shot so brilliantly where they Im- he doesn't only emphasize these relationships through these kind of like little you know things you're, you're saying with like these little kind of writing things also with you know how once again this framing right where if you want to notice whenever he like for instance whenever he shoots like um doc boone and what's the curl is it curly is that his name the clergyman or not the clergyman but you know the uh, uh <laughs> marshall curly yeah is, wait no no not curly sorry which one is um who's the uh whiskey salesman derek who's the what whiskey salesman that was, oh uh peacock peacock yeah okay so whenever you like like the last times where he'll frame peacock and doc boone together right because that's kind of a fun juxtaposition but then what he does with dallas and lucy is he'll put um what's the guy's name gosh i should do like I thought I wrote on everyone's name, but what's the name of the uh the like the larger dude? Um uh, Gatewood. Gatewood, yeah. Um he'll put he has Gatewood in between them, right? And it's always like a it's it's framed out a bit more, so you really get like this isn't like a direct um juxtaposition. It's like he's really emphasizing like how like, apart they are, how like apart Lucy and Dallas are. You know, mm-hmm. and they don't need to be friends together. Like you could just give you know close-ups of Gatewood, or you could do what he does with the other two, where it's just like Gatewood and Lucy or Gatewood and Dallas. But he really wants to emphasize like a spectrum that Lucy and Dallas are on, how they're on entirely different ends. Yeah, that whole spectrum thing was like, I noticed that too. That's a really cool concept. Mm-hmm. And it's further emphasized, and I guess which is like, and this is an accurate number. From when I first time like film just blew me away when we talked about this scene, but in my film class we learned about this dinner scene, right? Where he uses like point of view to um really I guess like emphasize the different characters. Where if you look at how the table is set up, um whenever we see um Lucy or not Lucy rather, Dallas and um Ringo together. We always see it's like a uh, head-on shot, you know, like or like which is exactly where Lucy is sitting. So we see them from Lucy's point of view, which I think is like super interesting because it's all about you know showing, I guess, like it's how she's viewed, how she's like constantly looked at, you know, um, Dallas's, and yeah. like the difference between how she's usually looked at and how he looks at her. Mm-hmm. And I suppose exactly. treats her. Wait, no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a lie. Wait, I got it mixed up. Sorry. It's we just see her from them from a generic point of view, but then what we get is we get Dallas's point of view whenever we see Lucy, right? So mm-hmm. Lucy, Dallas is always like looking to Lucy and like it's someone that. So we do feel like the staring on Dallas, right? But that's by everybody, and we feel staring on Lucy 
by Dallas, but it's like looking up to her, you know? Because hmm. that's what Lucy wants to be. It's like a desirable sort of stare. You mean Dallas? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's what Dallas wants to be. Yeah, it's a desirable sort of stare. I'm going to get this mixed up a lot. Funny, you guys. Okay. I felt a lot. Derek, what, give me something you liked. <laughs> oh, I kind of already talked about it, but it's kind of interesting how, like, this is, I already talked about how, like, Ringo the Kid is, like, the seminal, like, anti-hero, kind of, it, but without, the interesting thing is that he's not really an anti-hero. Like, an anti-hero has to be, like, something, like, well, um, like, wrong with his personality but we have this but like we see, right you would think yeah. that we would see yeah. yeah but we see that the other people mainly negatively like we see gatewood being like just generally awful and like doc boone being a drunkard but ringo the kid literally just gives himself up to the authorities mm-hmm. and he treats like dallas with absolute respect like that he treats like everyone equally and so he's like kind of the center of equality and like actual like goodness yet he has this like bad past similarly to how like dallas does but i don't think that's too important i think it's more important that he's like um kind of the center of the quality and then everyone else is kind of on like we've already talked about a spectrum but i think this is more like a moral spectrum as well as like um kind of a a political spectrum because we see dark boone is literally fought for the north and hatfield literally fought for the south Mm -hmm. so there's that kind of spectrum there and then we see like the spectrum between like lucy and dallas in their respective like expectations of the like society on their like kind of ladylike behavior and whatnot it's kind of like a judgment on that from we use kind of from that like all these spectrums kind of uh bringo as like the center of that kind of like we see it from his not point of view but basically we use him as the fulcrum for that you made me realize that this whole movie is, like, just such a great allegory for, like, post-Civil War America, because, like, just as all of these, like, people who are very different and at odds with one another get, like, stuck into a small space for a long period of time, like, that's kind of, like, just what happened at the end of the Civil War, right? Mm-hmm. These two very disparate sides with very different beliefs and who have done bad things to one another are now basically, like, forced to be stuck in the same area and get along. Exactly, and it's kind of is uh I guess this isn't a Western in that way in that it's kind of like higher. This is like a look on the entirety of the U.S. at this time. So maybe that's why it's uh, not as so much a Western. Uh, maybe just a little bit higher. Sure, level. but so is literally everything, right? Yeah. I think like for me, what makes it a Western? Because you mentioned earlier, like that it's a Western because it's like about the West and all of these like relationships among people that live in the West. I, to me, what would make it more of a Western is it not being about the West in terms of like the politics and like social dynamics, but just being about the West, like more like visually, if that makes sense. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we have all these beautiful landscape shots and stuff. Yeah, kind of glorifying the West in that way. I like- what I'm saying, it's, it's not a Western in my view because it doesn't utilize Western tropes visually that much. Like, really? it's, a, it's like, about the West, like, historically, but it's not about the West, like, aesthetically and, like, as a setting. Like, it's, it's not really about the West as a setting. It's about the West as, like, a historical topic. Yeah, but aren't literally all Westerns, Caleb? I don't know about that. No, because a lot of Westerns aren't actually about the politics of the West at all. They're just about... Like, some random stories but like they have all of these like western tropes and visuals like i don't know like you know playing know. cards I feel like and a lot of cigars westerns. and i feel like a lot of westerns though are about uh i don't like, are... i mean they may be i'm not saying that a lot of westerns aren't but i'm saying that the determining feature isn't about being about the what you have to analyze the west as a like as a setting in terms of like a background, as a background, I guess you could say. It's not about the West, like a Western, like being about the West politically isn't enough, I guess is what I'm saying. But I think it does, it does talk about the background. There's like a lot of that. I mean, I mean, literally, the it, background situation is 
<laughs> uh, very real uh, and pressing, like pretty much life and death in like the West, which is Indian and a conflict. Yeah, isn't that like literally the West is yeah. Native American, I guess, uh, you know, whatever you can call it, I guess, like colonialist conflict. But that's still, you're still thinking about it from like a historical perspective. Like you're thinking about like the, the West as a history and not as like the aesthetic, like, like think, think about like the most cowboy cow you can imagine in your head. Like every feature that a cowboy has, this cowboy has, right? Like John Wayne doesn't really look like that. He looks just more like a dude in like a very simple stripped down like Western getup. But oh. he's not like the most cowboy cowboy you can imagine. Like in my mind, like the most cowboy cowboy would be like a very like Clint Eastwood kind of vibe. And that's like the stuff that I think of when I think of like a true genre <laughs> western because it's like it's visually a lot more western, I guess you could say. I don't know. I mean, he literally pulls up with the uh, with his cowboy hat on. He has a gunsling. He has the bandana, and he uh, guns down three men with three bullets. <laughs> And we constantly get the what's literally the Western shot, right? Of like the uh, the shoulders up. Yep. What well, shoulders up? Or shoulders up, like the, the chest up. Yeah, Western shot. That's what it's called. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Let me look it up. Like, uh, it's like how you frame, it's how someone's framed. I see. Where it's like uh, I'm it's looking it up right now so I can see what you're talking about. And even perhaps, uh, I don't think that necessarily makes it worse. Or lesser in any way. No, I no, I'm just... Yeah, sure. But I still feel like it's a Western also. Like, literally, if you look at, like... I mean, there's so many, like, landscape shots and stuff. It's glorifying the Wild West, Joe, in this way. Yeah, that's true. I guess, yeah, especially the landscape shots. That's a good point. How about that uh, singing scene? Which scene? The one with the wife singing. Oh yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna. Uh, when you asked, like, what was like the one that struck you the most? That was like m- very interesting to me because you kind of get um an interesting shot of her like intentionally like leading, letting the people like steal the horses and whatnot. But mm-hmm. it's like at first it's like, what is she doing? She's just singing. And it's like, oh, she's singing as a distraction so they don't yeah. hear them. I was like, oh, and it like clicked, and I was like, wow. That was so brilliant. Like it's so great, isn't it? That's such a brilliant way to do that. I I would have never like thought in my like a million years to do that. And he doesn't <laughs> reveal it for so long until like the very end what uh like when they're actually like writing off what's going on. Cuz it distracts us too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the brilliance. Oh. Of it. It's like you want this just to be like a beautiful a beautiful moment. But um it ends up being unfortunately a lot more Yeah, I was I was very impressed with that. But, um, I would say like, the western shots from the uh, the waist up, so you can see the guns. Yeah, you gotta see the guns and the holsters. Also, but yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, th- I feel like the story c- kind of centers around how uh, maybe not centers, but a lot of the character development is around. Um, like, kind of how Dallas is treated. Like, uh, Doc Boone, I, I think, is, like, the first one to start, uh, begin to treat her, like, nicely after Ringo does. And then, I guess, um, I, I think it was Hatfield. Who, like, I don't know, it was Lucy. And then it was Hatfield. It's, like, they kind of, like, start including her more. And it's kind of, like... She lets, her, she lets her hold her baby and stuff. Yeah, and she starts letting her hold her baby, which is, like... I guess after, she also helps her pass her baby. Yeah. 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 So it's, like, these fairly big character development moments mm-hmm. uh, around this seemingly insignificant character at the beginning, to be honest. She's the most significant. And then it's, like, oh, like, all these people are, like, changing because of her, basically. It's really cool. Um, that's a. I kind of want to move on soon. Guys, have any more thoughts on this movie? Um, let me read my notes. Um, I also really like that whole like the post-birth scene. I think it's like both really funny, but also just, like really like intelligently shot. Mm-hmm. But the whole um, 
Buck with the whole like, uh, why didn't anybody tell me? Oh, I was gonna say this. Um, it's kind of when I was. Why didn't anybody tell me about? Yeah, Bird. that was great. <laughs> Fucking so great. I'll be doggone. <laughs> saying, I'll be doggone. Yeah, what you say, Derek? I, I was going to say this when I was talking about like the spectrum on Doc Boone and uh, Hatfield. It's interesting because Hatfield's like the one who like confronts him about being a drunk, basically, and yeah. needing to give the baby. Partially because like we've seen Hatfield being like the gentleman, like, you got to help the lady. <laughs> But also, mm -hmm. it's interesting because, like, Hatfield obviously represents, like, Southern, uh, like, beliefs and whatnot. And Doc Boone's, like, the Northern soldier, so he represents the North. So it's kind of like the South confronting the North about the things they, they're doing wrong. It's interesting, right? Yeah, like, but then also, what is, how does Hatfield really help her? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so this is kind of like an exhibition where, like, Doc Boone's still just doing the right thing, but he doesn't have the facade that, you know, Hatfield would like. Yeah, exactly. Um. <laughs> um, and then also we haven't talked about it, I think, enough. But that chase scene was actually fire. Oh, it's so great! Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Talk about it, Derek. Like, I'm. I was like, there's so much going on at one time. Like, I want to talk about like the editing first. I think it was kind of interesting. Um, shows like very interesting cuts in between like the wagon running and towards the people like at first it's not like a lot of cuts to um the actual like people chasing them like the indians chasing them the apaches um and uh, as like like the ringo and hatfield start like or i guess i should start when the arrow like penetrates like peacock it's like all of a sudden oh that's so cool and it's like just like and i forget what he's saying at that moment but it's like I think it's like something like we're kind of out of the clear. It might have not been like that straight on, but um, and it's like just like out of nowhere and just like so shocking, and it like takes so long for them to actually cut to the Apaches after that. I thought that was like mm -hmm. an interesting choice because it's like obviously still focused on the stagecoach and like the chaos of that, and then like as the Ringo like starts actually like hitting his shots and like Hatfield starts hitting his shots, and like it, everything gets more desperate as they're running out of ammo. Um, it kind of like starts changing back and forth between like um the stagecoach and the apaches but not like distractingly it's like kind of at an interesting angle from like the side so you kind of like can see the progression and like the speed of everything going still which i thought was really cool and kind of far away um so i thought that was an interesting take and then it's the last kind of shot is like a longer shot on hatfield like putting the last bullet in his revolver and about to shoot lucy with her eyes closed and it's like you hear the trumpet of the army coming and then it finally cuts to the army it really is just so brilliant and then of course yeah the whole like actual scene itself right yeah where it's you're just really fun. like without ever cheating people literally coming out of nowhere it really feels like it's like a hydra of apaches you know mm -hmm. where once you shoot one it just seems like two more pop up you know but they're not actually doing that, right? And it's brilliant because it's like this giant landscape. So it's really just through how they're showing them to us, right? Where they just kind of show a few at first. And that kind of expands out. And you realize there's yeah. more and there's more. And they're catching up. It really adds, like, a lot of suspense. Like, it, and then it starts off with, like, Peacock getting shot. So it's obviously so disruptive and, like, shocking already. It's, like, built on that so effectively. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the whole John Wayne jumping from horse to horse oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. With I wonder how, in like, influential and, like, important that was. Because I bet that was, like, crazy. This was, like, 1939. I bet that was crazy. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I don't even like how exactly how they do this scene. I'm still, like, not entirely sure. Yeah, that whole thing, it seemed very, like, um, what's the word? Like, almost, like, anachronistic. Like, mm -hmm. so ahead of its time. Yeah, very impressive work. I, I, imagining like this movie coming out in 1939 would must have like blown people's minds. Oh, I'm yeah, it had to have. Okay, we could talk about Hannah and her sisters. Um, yeah, because you know Hannah has two of them, so it's like a lot of people to talk about. Oh, in the bar scene, I I kind of like realized this note. Um, when we see like the the I think Flumer Flumer brothers in the bar, they keep. I realize, like, they keep 
the important people in the foreground and like the unimportant things in like the background but still like within focus so you can like you notice them so it's without being like overwhelming and it's like so well balanced that it's like really impressive because it's like such a wide shot and it would be so easy to just like lose everything in the shot but everything's importance kept so well in the foreground that it's i don't know there's something about it that's just like really impressive And that was the last thing I had. What did you think of the whole, like, Hatfield, who's he going to kill thing? Uh, like, he points the gun to Lucy, and then he points it to his head. Yeah. Maybe I have the order mixed up, but... I, I think it's the reverse order. He, initially, yeah, to his head, yeah, then to Lucy. Yeah, because he realizes, like, oh, uh, it'd probably be the better idea to kill her. It'd be the more, more gentleman, gentlemanly thing in the situation. <laughs> But really, like, what did you do in Hatfield? <laughs> yeah, because, oh, because, like, the context of that is if they're running out of bullets, so eventually they're going to get killed or captured, and if they're captured, the women will be raped. And so his gentlemanly uh, duties is to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, sure, but at some time, like, you can just look at the window, like, they're actually just about to win this. Because like, that's literally, like, right before they win. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also supposed to be suspenseful for the audience. Yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. Hannah Sisters. Um, Woody Allen movie. It's about Hannah and her two sisters. And kind of her ex-husband. And her husband. Not a lot of people. I think it's funny that uh, Woody Allen's character was like only tangentially related until like kind of the end. Yeah, that's interesting. Because, like, up until the point when um, he kind of, like, gets back with Holly or whatever, it's kind of just, like, this group of people in one area and then also, like, the ex-husband who, like, yeah. kind of pops in for his own, like, completely unrelated bit every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Can I finish the plot line, please? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Anna. you must have cut out or I cut out or something. And sisters, Holly and Lee. And Lee was, uh, Lee is, has a boyfriend named Frederick. Ha uh, Hannah is married to this guy named Elliot. And Elliot and Lee are having an affair that, um, looks like it's going to go somewhere, but it ends up not. And Elliot stays with Hannah. But Hannah's ex husband, Mickey, ends up marrying Hannah's sister, Holly, at the end. We'll do a good job. Quick summary. Good job, okay. dude. Also, there's April and she sucks. Um, but yeah, I thought this movie was great. Mm -hmm. I do agree that it's quote we Allen intentionally related, but also he's kind of like the main character, arguably, you know, or at least like him and Holly. How so? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? Like, they're I guess the main juxtaposition to like to Lee and Elliot, right? I think they're kind of the storyline that's really unfolding all along. You know what I mean? Like, they are our conclusion, right? Yeah, I, I, suppose, yeah, I, yeah, I actually I understand that. Like, they're really the only characters that have, like, a major change. Like, obviously, um, Hannah is still with her husband. A mission change narratively. A mission yeah. narratively, yeah. And um, what's her name? Me, uh, me and Frederick break up. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, the thing is, like, Lee's in the same, basically the same situation she was before. She gets with the older man who is, uh, has things to teach her. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's basically the same situation for her. Basically the same situation for Hannah. Uh, Elliot just re reconfirms his love for her and, like, everything's fine. Um, the only ones that really change is Mickey and Holly. Yeah, the... Plots are basically, like, they kind of, like, foil each other. Like, they're, like, complementary, basically. Yeah. It's like, right when one of them sort of, like, I don't want to say, like, fizzles out, but, like, is, like, resolved in such a way that there's, like, not that much more to see or talk about, the other one, like, picks up the slack, basically. And so, like, basically, you just kind of bounce back and forth so that they both have the chance to, like, evolve at their natural pace, I guess you could say. Yes and no, though. Because, I mean, the main plot we're given is... 
Holly or is Lee and Elliot, right? Yeah. I and mean, that is our main plot. I don't think it's much I think it when I was watching the movie, it didn't feel like bouncing back and forth. It felt like this whole Mickey Holly thing were two separate storylines slowly colliding that like really felt super background. Like I said, because Woody Allen's character does feel so so tangential and Holly also feels like pretty tangential to what's mm-hmm. happening with this kind of like main drama of mm-hmm. Hannah, Elliot, and Lee. And yeah, but, like, but it's so cool like, how that ends up converging. I think the whole point of this movie, and I think it's important to feel that way because the whole point of this movie is timing, right? It's just kind yeah. of like how you really think you're sure things are gonna go, but like honestly, all life comes down to at the end of the day is just timing. And this kind of like unpredictability of life, right? Where Woody Allen's character, um, I mean, he goes out with Holly, right? And they just don't get along. And like, conversely, I do think there's like an alternate universe where maybe like Lee and Elliot, you know, they do this exact same thing like a year later and they end up getting together, right? But it just wasn't time yet. Yeah, that's true. Um, for either of them, or especially, you know, for Elliot, I guess, more in particular. But uh, what I mean is, like, that I think if you didn't have the Woody Allen plot, like, the the main plot would be, like, really boring. Because basically what happens is, like, you return to status quo at the end. So, like, yeah, if, if your whole plot was, like, okay, they're going to have an affair, but then in the end they're going to realize that they don't want to have an affair and they're going to go back to status quo, it'd be, like, well... Oh, totally. No, okay. it's, like, yeah, it's the most important part. So, That's what I kind of say to the main characters. Yeah. So they're but complimentary. Really so, like, as one kind of falls off, the other one basically picks up in being, like, in narrative push, I guess okay, you Yeah, that's what you're saying. I guess my... So that you kind of made it seem more like it's, like, a ping-ponging sort of thing where, like, one's boring and the other one's exciting. The other one, this one's exciting, this one's boring, and it kind of goes back and forth. But it's really just a back, a day forth. You know? Yeah, that's fair. One to one. Um, And I do agree. And I think it's so genius. Um, I think one of the most brilliant parts... Is yeah, like how closely the two storylines actually reflect. Because there's a point where um he even says, like, I always had a little crush on her. Her like uh Willie Allen's character Mickey says this about Holly. Mm-hmm. You know? Just so genius because that's basically how how he yeah. talks about Lee, right? Is he always had a little crush on her. And it really shows that like that could have worked out. It just wasn't the right place in the right time. And like mm-hmm. Maybe like this whole like relationship thing isn't as cosmic as it is just situational. Yeah. And like all of life is just so situational, right? With the whole Woody Allen shooting thing, right? Um, which oh, is yeah. the most important part of it, which is what obviously leads you to the conclusion about how it's situational. Because the gun, you know, slips right past his head, and who knows what would have happened. This really turns his life around and kind of gets him to explore more things, which is also so brilliant because. That's something that like is kind of revealed at the end, but not in like in this corny like it's there's not this like this big sense like why did Woody Allen leave show business right? Mm-hmm. It's, why did Mickey leave show business? It's more just you don't even like really know you know what I mean. You just kind of assume it's everything's happening with the whole you know possible brain tumor or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's this actual other life event, and it's just so brilliantly done. I love that. I thought the acting in this movie was, like, actually top tier. Oh, for sure, for sure. The scene with the three sisters. Oh, uh, and it spins around? Movie? Yes. That, That's so cool. I'm going to say right now, the most well-acted scene we've watched of any of the movies so far. Yes. It's up it's there. so, so good. All of them are conveying so much emotion and so much, like, subtleties, but also, like, a good sort of exaggerations. Oh my gosh, it's brilliant. And of course, the camera's pinned right close to on their face. Like, this can't be an easy job, but it's just so well done. And you really feel like the emotion behind all three of them. Yeah, for sure. Derek, what are your thoughts on the movie? Um, let me see. Where to start? Um, I pretty much already said what I thought oh, about geez. it, honestly. Um, <laughs> uh, Actually, I didn't say everything, um, but... I hope it's not all you have to say. We're going to have to find a different person to podcast with, Derek. <laughs> got, like, two sentences on a movie. Yeah, but that was, like, basically my thesis. Is that... Really, Mickey's the only one that changes. And it's kind of just... It's not so much Hannah and her sisters as Mickey and Holly. 
well, no, 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 no. everyone else changes too, or at least uh, Elliot does definitely. Uh, yeah, they yeah, change perspective. They just don't change like their actual state, which I think is fine. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're... so but Elliot's basically like... in the same situation. But he's a dynamic and, character. Yeah, and the change that occurs to him is internal, right? Is really it... internal, but really just because Lee decides to do go her own way. Like if... that's not true, though. No, yeah. no, no it's it's just as much of an Elliot decision as it is a Lee decision. That's made very clear. I don't know about that. It, it is, seems to me the that the reason why that he stops trying to have an affair with Lee is because she decides not to. But that no, is that's not, that's yeah, not true at all. It's the reason she stops trying wanting to though is because he won't break up with Hannah. Yeah, that's literally what it was. It's because he refused to divorce his wife, so she was like, "Well, if you're not going to do anything." Yeah, I'm exactly. Otherwise, he would have uh, stayed with the status quo. That's my point. Yeah, but he still made a decision that he that he didn't want to divorce his wife and full commit to the affair. I mean, was divorce even on the... Well, I suppose that's a decision, but yeah. I think there's less of a decision <laughs> so much as inaction. I don't think inaction is a decision in this situation as much as um, a decision to stay with the status quo. He's fine with what he gets from the affair, and he is fine with he gets with the marriage still. I don't know if he's even fine with what he gets from the affair because he's obviously like pretty torn up about he it. He literally says he's guilty every single time. Yeah. And it's definitely a decision, dude. He's like literally talking to his therapist about it. He literally afraid, runs up like, I just don't know what to do. And the whole point is, what this does though, is it gives him perspective on his marriage, right? Where like, he understands who Hannah is, but that doesn't mean that he has to break up with her, right? And like, how he can be unhappy with an aspect of someone but that's like totally okay and that he really just does at the end of the day he just loves hannah a bunch and he even says there's the whole thing where it's like i think you love hannah more than you willing to admit or whatever i suppose yeah. yeah that is a change but my point is so much that it's barely a change and realizing that you really love someone ultimately when you already do isn't much of a change from not loving someone to really loving someone or nah. having a crush on someone to really loving someone in the case of Mickey and Holly. No, so, that's that's not true, though. I really don't think that's true. I think it's literally not much of a change. I guess it's he, like his whole demeanor is like contrary to how it was at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. I mean, he seems to be acting basically the same from the beginning of the movie, except for no. the, from in the beginning, uh, what he's like we see, falling over himself. What we see at the beginning is uh, that internally he's like nervous around Lee. So again, I suppose internally, yes, there's no, some but it's change. external too, and that's like where his acting comes in so well too. This is like yeah, I agree. So that's very good acting. But what are you all, doing in this movie, by the way? <laughs> for all like intensive purposes, like <laughs> from outside perspective. Like, at the very least, Hannah doesn't notice these things. No, she does, though. <laughs> no, she kind of doesn't. No, I she does, that. yeah, she does towards the beginning when he's, like, but not, like, in a very meaningful way. Like, you mean how he's acting towards Lee or how he's acting towards her? How he's acting towards her, and at the... No, he does, she does, though. Yeah, yeah at sure. the middle. Yes! Yeah, and that's at the, the beginning, height, and that's the height of internal. his arc. Yeah, the, at, that's the... And then it becomes external, and then because it becomes external... She is allowed to react externally, and he has to make another internal decision, which results in them becoming significantly closer. Like, which is fine, yes. My point isn't that, is that he and, barely changes from beginning to end. Like, displacement-wise, he barely changes. Not, on, not his trajectory, the distance he travels. Other way around. You're saying... Like, the distance yeah, he travels may be, like, larger than uh, yeah. the displacement, but his displacement is barely, ne like, barely anything. No, but I so I really disagree, because it's, like, I don't think you can view it in, like, these literally two-dimensional terms, where what's happening, I think, is so much more than just, like, you can't view it as, like, close and not close. I guess that's, like, my primary issue, is it's just about acceptance, right? And there's this whole thing where Hannah... I mean, Hannah's whole thing, right, is that she's kind of unable to be helped. And that's what he loves so much 
about Lee, right? She is someone that needs help. She, you know, ever over relationships, she needs help. Mm -hmm. Um, but he realizes that, like, I guess this, but the whole reason he likes Hannah is because she doesn't need help. So it's like he stops trying to help her and, like, loves her for who she is. I think we can kind of, I mean, he's saying, I'm having, like, you can assume that he's having these struggles with a, you know, become audible in the middle of the movie because he's you know two was too nice of a guy to be being uh, too nice but i guess kind of too um he wasn't upfront enough to really ever confront her but he has these struggles where she is uh she doesn't need help right and he hates that about her and she's like that's so silly but um yeah that's i guess what happens is he kind of accepts it and, and i imagine that. that's who she is. her arc is deal. that she also accepts that that's something that he needs which is i suppose uh isn't like something I disagree with. I think that's really cool and an interesting theme. But ultimately, from a narrative's perspective, from a takeaway from the movie, he barely changes. Okay, I think I'm it's fair to say that it's a return to status quo, like at the end, more or less. Yeah, that's that's that was from my like thesis. A narrative perspective. Yeah, that was literally my thesis. Sure. sure. But you're saying uh, he's not making decisions. I just disagree with that. He makes like several, several decisions. What I think is interesting is how they have some characters that, like, on paper have, like, a lot of similarities, but occupy, like, very different thematic roles, I guess you could say. So, for example, uh, Elliot and, um, what was the guy's name? Frederick. Uh, Frederick. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, yeah, because they're both, like, all about art, basically. And, uh, that's kind of, like, it's, like, one of their defining character traits is that they're, like, artistic but they go about it in completely different ways and obviously are like very different characters. So I thought that was like interesting and I haven't quite teased out yet exactly like what the differences are. But well, the like, way the differences in who? Uh, Frederick and Elliot, cause they basically both interact and relate to uh, Lee because of art. And that's kind and of like, well, art is obviously like a major the instruction thing too, right? Or in terms of instruction, oh. right? They both like help and show her things and stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think it's important because the big difference between them, right, is Frederick. As he says, we is his connection to the world, mm -hmm. you know. And what Elliot wants is someone who, um, someone who he can be a connection for, right? Yeah, that's totally, that's like a really good way of summing it up. I also want to note though that she does share art to Elliot back because she puts on a record for him. Yeah, and then, so it's not one directional. Yeah, but I still think he's like the main instructor, right? He's always getting. He just says always giving him books and stuff. Yeah, that's fair. But it is true though. Yeah, well, even, also, well, well, even then he says yeah. like, "Yeah, this is my yeah. favorite. This is um, Bob yeah. so and so." Oh, that's true. That's trying. Yeah, you're right. But I, I love that whole like, like kind of running theme of this movie, basically as some sort of like transcendent or like redemptive force. Because they kind of go from like they literally talk about like almost every form of art in this movie. They talk about philosophy, they talk about architecture, music, literature, movies. Like pretty much every main form of art gets brought up and discussed at some point which I thought was so cool and then of course like the final scene when like he's watching the movie and pretty much like literally says like you should not kill yourself because there are good movies out there dude oh it's so great yeah gosh I like it always messes me up like how much I relate to Woody Allen movies because like obviously they shouldn't <laughs> be right Just, like, on a very, like, fun movie level. which by the way um, hey, you like couple... movies and Woody Allen likes movies we had a couple yikes in stagecoach we didn't talk about with the whole, you know, like uh, Indians thing. It just, you know, maybe some kind of um, racist depictions of them. Um, definitely though, the biggest yikes moment of these two movies was uh, the Woody Allen child molestation joke. <laughs> definitely, definitely did not age well. <laughs> Wait, which you know joke? So when he's like, uh, they're in like the TV studio, and he's like. I guess like he had like a child molestation joke that got canceled. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. He's like, "What happened? What happened? What the child? Oh, what, why can't we do the child molestation joke?" And it's like, "Cause that's not appropriate." It's like, "Come on, come on." <laughs> it's like, "Oh no!" 
especially because like that's timeline wise, we're probably not that far off. <laughs> that's actually true. I didn't think about that last part. And like, of course, you know, Mia Farrow's in it, and oh yeah. my gosh, <laughs> it's just like this is not the time, buddy. He makes his movies too much of a self insert. Yeah, he really does. <laughs> really just dragging out his family's drama in the middle of this movie. It's funny because he's dragging out their uh, his little IRL drama, and um, yeah. Holly drags out the in uh, the movie drama, like their I don't family. Think we have it. And I don't think Husbands and Wives is uh, on our uh, Woody Allen list. Yeah, it's not. It's uh, number eight. But um, that movie's super yikes when it comes to like, <laughs> it's literally just like and this is me, all of me and me, uh, all of me and Mia's problems. Sorry, me and Mia messed me up. Um, this is all of me and Mia's problems. Gonna make a movie about it. Oh, like, oh Woody. Which is also funny because uh, her character in this movie writes a screenplay or a TV script. There's really a, mo- a confessional about all of her family's problems. Well, no, Holly does. No. Holly, that's what I was talking about. Holly Mia, writes. Mia Farrow is Hannah. Yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Holly writes that script. That's basically like overly a confessional. What you say, Derek? Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier. How uh, it was interesting. He brings up his IRL drama, and then in the movie, uh, Hi- <laughs> yeah. Holly also does her um, IRL dramas. Yeah, big yikes to the child molestation thing. That's a hard no for me, Woody. But, yeah, I mean, where were we at? We're talking about, oh, do you know what scene really messed me up? Was that scene we kind of just referenced between Frederick and Lee? Like, their kind of breakup scene? Oh, yeah. With the whole, he goes, you're my connection, only connection to the world. And she's like, oh, God, that's too much responsibility for me. It's not fair. Like, oh, that whole thing just, like, yeah. hits you close to home, do 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 Jeez, I think the great thing about this movie, it, I think Michael Caine is, like, so great in this movie because <laughs> what he does is basically <laughs> serves as a counterbalance to a Woody Allen movie getting too Woody Allen-y. You know yeah, what I mean? Because we have, like, this, this, like, counterpart male lead that kind of, like, is a very different character in, like, a ton of ways. And so, like, we get the Woody Allen self-insert stuff that makes his movies charming, but it's not so much that it's, like, oh, my God, I'm watching a Woody Allen movie. Mm-hmm. Especially because, yeah, he's the main male character, too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so it's, like, it's like just enough. Show. It's a good balance. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, like, all of his stuff Why is, so is he funny. in this movie? It's so weird. <laughs> It works. Like it he has so many funny scenes, and he acts like so well. Like the part where he's like, "All right, this has to be done skillfully and diplomatically." Oh, and then all so of a sudden, funny. he just like pops into frame and makes it over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Michael Caine was killing it. Oh gosh, but Woody Allen, this is like definitely. I mean, he still just plays himself, but he has some like hysterical lines in terms of, like pure comedy. This is like one of his funniest. Yeah, I'm pretty cool. sure. My favorite quote by him uh, was by him. Uh, Which one was that? Uh, I think that was Basically towards the spoiler. end. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, just, uh, it's me a spoiler, so save for the favorite quote section, okay? Yeah, I'll save it. But I really love the whole. Um, there was a. He was like talking about like, some like disease he had, and he was, like there was a classic appearance of like a black spot on my on your back and she's like it was on your shirt yeah. I was like, well everyone was staring at my back so <laughs> uh, i think actually i have a feeling i know what your favorite quote is Derek. yeah uh, yeah um around there too i had some but, specific idea in mind for that one but yeah just so and of course the him and holly scene the flashback is yeah that's pretty cool. great the whole rock stars thing, and then um, they're insulting each other, taking turns. He's like, "You should, you should stay with those groups that look like they, um, they're gonna stab their mother." Yeah. Uh, but yeah, once again, the whole like, I always had a little crush on her thing, and that's when you kind of realize exact. That's uh, at least for me, that was the aha moment. You know, I'm mm-hmm. like, that's where this movie's going. You know, you mm-hmm. can see it right there because it's so cool. This movie almost feels like a blend between like your, like, prototypical Woody Allen movie, like Annie Hall or something, and mm-hmm. then, like, um, Purple Rose of Cairo, 
Because yeah. like, the Woody Allen stuff is all about Woody Allen, and it's all about his being zany and neurotic and all of his, like, nihilistic outlook and stuff like that. And then Purple Rose is, like, all about, like, the beauty of art and how it's going to, like, basically rescue you from the crappiness of life. And then, like, Michael Caine's side, or his story, is basically the Purple Rose of Cairo theme, where it's, like, all about art. And, like, when they're having an affair, there's, like, classical music playing, and, like, it's all, like, about interactive quality. And then Woody Allen side of the story is like his typical stuff so it just like it combines the two things that woody allen does really well i like that Caleb. i definitely agree um what's he gonna say oh, speaking of annie hall by the way you got me thinking do you guys uh Caleb, you see annie hall right yeah derek have you i have not oh well there's like a character in annie hall who's like a much more main character in annie hall who plays oh. um Woody Allen's like ex partner in this movie. Oh, it's like, really, really funny because they both go to California. Like in Annie Hall, he also goes to California and like leaves him mm. in New York. <laughs> just, like, I noticed that actually. Yeah, it was like really it's, funny. It's like the that same must guy. Have been a theme too. in his life. Yeah, or it's also literally the same guy too. It's literally the same character. Um, oh, that's funny. But yeah, it's, I think it's like a nice little. I don't know if it's a callback or which way. I thought the funniest like, thing was that. Uh, he was like, let's get a third opinion when he was like, found out he was infertile or whatever. He was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is like... the third opinion, or a second opinion. <laughs> is like, yeah. let's get a third. And it's like, they don't. And it turns out that he can <laughs> Yeah, nothing's have kids. wrong. There's nothing wrong. Oh, that's the kid, the kid. The... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's so brilliant. I thought that was pretty funny. And that epitomizes it, right? We're literally, it's just all about timing. And like, some things just are meant to be, and some things just aren't. And there's like no really explaining it. Yeah, you know, he tries to like seek the religion to explain it, but it's really not. It's just yeah. And he also sets it up it... with like being like a, his character being a literal hypochondriac. So kind of like yeah. Oh, he just being how he usually is. Mm-hmm. But then it's like oh, never mind. He's actually right this time. Dude, I didn't even actually pick that up. That is so funny. Oh, I just not see what you're saying. That's actually true. I yeah, didn't think about that, either. that was like one so of my hilarious. favorite parts, to be honest. <laughs> Since you brought it up, all the religion stuff also was like fucking hilarious. Oh, oh yeah, definitely was. What was like the... when he's like when he goes home and tells his like Jewish parents that he's gonna become <laughs> yeah. a Catholic, and they're like, <laughs> "Why?" Yeah, I wasn't gonna do the I wasn't gonna do the uh, impersonation. You could do that. You're one gonna believe in Jesus Christ? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "I don't know. I'm gonna give it a shot." I mean, all these people <laughs> like him. I'm gonna give it a shot. <laughs> You know, I was uh, I I can never get on board the Judaism thing, you know. <laughs> and then his, his dad is like the complete like I don't know opposite reaction to his mom. I can't even remember what his dad says. I just remember yeah, his mom. Like, honestly, was like, like why do you care so much? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much what he says. Like, why do you care all of a sudden? He's like, yeah, you aren't you why afraid? You... When are you just talking what about God? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, why do you care about dying all that stuff? Yeah, it's like and it's like. <laughs> Aren't you, you afraid of dad? Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> uh, if I'm gonna you're, die, you're alive and... for now, and uh, yeah, and then you die. I'm gonna be unconscious. I'm not gonna know. And if I am conscious, I'll deal with it then. <laughs> uh, so funny. So self-insert. <laughs> and also him like talking to the Krishna people. I thought it was pretty funny. Oh, it's just so his, great. Just this shaven head white dude, like, handing out the books. Like, yeah, just read your books. And he's like, uh, yeah, um, do y'all really believe this stuff? And he's like, uh, what's the, what's the solution? What's the meaning to life that you come up with? It's like, uh, we don't really have one. <laughs> <laughs> just read the books. Now, I yeah, think he has actually... so many great one-liners. Like, I have like so many good options for great quotes from this movie because he has so many good singers. He really does. Um, the other character, you know, the other half of Woody Allen in this movie is, of course, Holly, and I think her character is her development is so brilliant because she seems like such a one-dimensional character or two-dimensional character the entire movie. You know, mm-hmm. where it's like this is the sister who's going to keep asking for money and nothing's ever going to change for her. And then she's actually pretty good at the writing thing. And, like, this whole, like, trying everything. Like, once again, it's, like, similar to, like, the third. I mean, it's not as clever as, like, the, the third opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so brilliantly done where it's just, like, uh, 
she's like, I'm going to try writing now. And she's like, that's not, I don't just try to like, it's actually a career oriented. She's like, no, this is going to work. I promise, you know, and it's like, that actually does work. And it's just so great because she's just looking for happiness, right? The entire movie. And you think she's kind of doomed, you know? To me, she felt like, do you guys think she was going to ever get with somebody? No, I, I, I was not uh, expecting anything good to happen for her, to be honest. Because, you, yeah, do you think she's just going to be like, that's like how things usually go for like that. But really, it's just all about timing. And anyone can find love. And sometimes it's not even about the person. It's just about when you get with them. Yes, and then kind of like on the career side of things, like not only is she good at writing, but she was really good at cooking too. And but yeah, like she her was. cooking, but her cooking thing just didn't work out because of timing and like random events that are outside of her control. And so like because of thought, it's kind of like oh, Jesus Christ, she's like, oh yeah. Not so it's kind of like you gotta bro. keep trying until like mm-hmm. you know the timing works out, and it's and then eventually it's gonna work. I think it's so important because one thing she seems like doomed in love, right? And I think. They all learn the same lesson at the end. This is why I kind of like really think it's not a, a change because what he learns is it's not really about like I guess this is my thesis of it, right? Where it's not about like the qualities of the person that you're in love with, right? And like the qualities that like theoretically you should love or theoretically you shouldn't, or theoretically you do need or theoretically you don't, right? It's just about you know, the person Sometimes you just fall in love with the person and it doesn't really matter if it should work because sometimes it just does, right? That's yeah. the thing is, yeah, Hannah and Elliot, you're right, Derek, they do work and then they, it ends up with them continuing to work, right? But that's the whole point is because they shouldn't really work because Hannah is not actually what Elliot wants. He knows that it doesn't matter because it's what he has and it's who he loves. And it's true for Lee too, right? Like you said, she ends up with the same person, but that's important too because... She breaks up with Frederick for, at the end of the day, literally no reason, right? Mm-hmm. And just, it didn't work at that time, and maybe it wasn't going to work. Who knows? But, like, the point is, her and Frederick just weren't meant to be. But she gets somebody, you know, she doesn't have the exact same problems as she has with Frederick. Hopefully those two just love each other. It's just kind of how life works sometimes. Yep. Yeah, this is the, this is the uh, epitome of the... Sometimes it just be like that movie. Yeah. But it do. Um. Man, guys, that moving camera dinner scene is so good. Yep. Also, uh, on the uh, fuck April thing, the scene where the two of them are hitting on that uh, architect guy. Oh, yeah. And I. I up. Yeah, <laughs> when she's just like in her own head, I was like, oh, uh-huh. damn. That's. April just saying bullshit too. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I love that scene where um they're like debating like which one's gonna be dropped off first. Because mm-hmm. it's so like it's like so subtle. Like yeah. you sort of realize like whichever one's gonna be last is gonna have the opportunity. But like it's never really explicitly explained. It's just sort of like and like cause I kind of saw it coming, like as soon as he said like well, it's, like, time for me to drop you guys off now, right? And I was mm. sort of thinking, like, okay, which one is he going to drop off first? And then they literally bring it up. Like, mm. which one is he going to drop off first? And it's, like, there's all this subtext that, like, I don't know, it's really cool. Yeah, and it's kind of, like, the missed opportunity things. Like, you can see in, like, her head, or we literally get in her head, and it's, like, so yeah. real. Like, when you, like, like, fuck. You're so stupid, you got so nervous. You're yeah, tongue-tied. exactly. That's, like, so real. It's, like, you make up. Like all of these problems, and like from this one little mistake, and it's kind of like you just see in your own head. Like I don't know, it was pretty cool. I like that. Man, I really like this movie. Like when I watched it, I liked it like a lot. And now that we're talking about it, I'm liking it even more. Mm-hmm. It's really good. It's <laughs> it really, like, really, talks about, really good movie. Talks about a lot of things. Best. Really like hits you on a lot of levels. Yeah, it really does. It's like yeah, some of those scenes are just like really good to me. Um. It's like all this art stuff, and then also all this stuff about like just chill out and like let stuff happen because if it's gonna work, it's gonna work. One thing, and it's also, and it's, once again, like what he has really good. This it's also just like so many like while like all this is happening, right? Where there's like all these like, great like character developments, like these like kind of like big long setup jokes. That's just kind of so many little jokes, right? Like just like, non, like just like these kind of like verbal things that are so or 
non-verbal things that are so great. Like I love when uh so um not uh what's his face? Elliot brings this guy Dusty to see <laughs> Frederick, right? <laughs> Which is like this like random rock star. <laughs> Dusty gives him like a bro shake. <laughs> you can oh, see yeah. it. Yeah. It was like, that uh, was so <laughs> Frederick is so uncomfortable. Frederick's the real like loser in this movie. He really gets screwed. Poor Frederick. He's such a good character though. Like he's oh, developed he so well and like mm-hmm. acted so well too. Like they really like it's for such a side character that's like I guess one dimensional. Like he's kind of like a one note character, but like they made that note really good and like really high quality. Like, all of his stuff is, is written and acted so well that, like, it makes this kind of, like, random side character feel so rich, even though he, like, doesn't really do that much. Okay. And I think also, like, the verb, like, you, sp- you specifically said nonverbal, but I think even the verbal stuff is so good, too, especially when it comes oh, to, like, of course. Woody Allen, like, he's just always, like, snapping. Oh, yeah, no, that's, like, his best part. You know, besides like, uh, the verbal things. With the, when she's, like, talking about, like, I wonder if it's, like, something I did to become infertile, and she's, like, what, like, excessive masturbation? Then he's, like, don't knock my hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, also, it's even worse, because I think she says it. I, I don't remember the exact, like, it, I think, I think it's something you did. It's, like, how come it's something I did? And, uh, and she, yeah, I don't remember the exact order there, but. She was pretty savage on that one, Hannah was. Oh, yeah, actually, she brought, she mentioned excessive masturbation, and he says, like, to as a direct response, like, don't yeah, have my hobbies, yeah. No, I'm just saying the whole, like, maybe it's something, it, was, it wasn't something that I did, it's something that you did. Like, she was, oh. like, she was the one throwing the shade there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the whole, like, ending with the movie thing, we have lo- loves movies. It's actually interesting because I feel like this isn't much of a thing in, like, his other movies. It happens, like, the two we've watched, it's, like, these, like, a lot of themes about movies and stuff. Which, you know. mm-hmm. Yeah, he's specific. He like definitely like goes in when it comes to movies in this film with like talking about like how they're basically the reason why he doesn't kill himself. Yeah. Um, but like he also like uh, this is the part that I love when I was watching the movies like all the stuff about art and philosophy and music and like he really just like covers it all and basically shows why like it can provide a meaning for life, which is like I don't know, really hits home for me at least. Totally agree. You guys ready to vote? Sure. Yes, sir. Why well, something exciting for you two? All right, hit us. A new segment. Ooh. Whoop oh. whoop. Because now we're in the fourth round, right? And I thought, let's rank the movie each director. So I'm just gonna say, is it a step up or a step down? Okay. Oh, like what this. do you mean? So, for instance, um, if I said is the kid a step up or a step down from Monster Verdo? Derek, you would say a step down, I assume. Correct. Right? But we're going to do that. It's just the fourth best because I think when you get the sixth best, it's just like. Uh, it's kind of stacked against. It's, just, it's too much, you know. So it is like, kind of nice to know that, like, are we actually watching these in, you know, the order of one to five? So I'll start with Stagecoach. Is Stagecoach a step up or a step down? Uh, I really like Graves for Wrath. That's tough. I'm going to clue your step up. I think step like up as well, clear. just because of the broad things that it has to say about, like, politically, but I don't know. It's tough for me. If you do say that, sta- Grips Off is number five, so Stagecoach would, by definition, be in your top five. Yeah, I'd have to put it at my number four or three. I don't know. Uh, What's my number two, actually? Let me look at my number two. Um, No, yeah, it's definitely probably, probably number four. Actually, yeah, number four. Okay, Caleb, step up, so, step down. I will say that I think if I watched both Grapes of Wrath and Stagecoach a whole bunch of times, mm-hmm. I would probably say that Stagecoach is a step up because I can tell there's sure. like a lot in the movie that I didn't really get out of it. But I think on something that I can appreciate just from a first watch, I enjoyed watching Grapes of Wrath more. So okay. I can you can take that. that as you will. Yeah, We'll call I it can... a uh, sidestep. <laughs> And I would say the step up for sure. I think it's it just shot really intelligently. There's like so many little things going on. Like it's one of those movies you can just dissect for hours. And Chris Hour is the one that says, right, you can just keep watching John. Chris Hour is it Orson Welles or is it Hitchcock? It's one of those guys. 
So you can just keep watching John Ford for hours, and that's how you should learn everything you need to know about movies. Um, okay, Hannah or sisters, step up or step down for Purple Rose of Cairo? Step, step up. up. Easy. Yeah, I also step up. Although I have Purple Rose of Cairo is number two. So. Oh my god. <laughs> step up. Big for me. But I do think it is a step up. Yeah. By the way, funnily enough, we had Purple Rose of Cairo and Grapes of Wrath at 10 and 11, respectively. Or, yeah, 10 and 11, respectively. So, that's kind of a cool thing, too. So, we'll start with Derek. Derek, um, what do you drink better? I like uh, the stage of uh, Stagecoach more. Um, largely because I kind of enjoyed the, like, directorially it mm-hmm. more um and I, they both had interesting things wait, to say so I, I don't know why we were i definitely yeah, why did you skip all the like, other segments i don't know yeah, I got we, distracted. it's all right we can go back to them no 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 we should do those sections first stop well, talking well i already me. okay i'll re i'll re say what i'm going to say then best quote <laughs> <laughs> my bad guys um quote. My favorite was uh, Hannah and her sisters. What if there's no God and you only go around once and that's it? Don't you want to be a part of the spirits? What the hell? It's not an, all a drag. It's just stop ruining my life searching for answers I'm never going to get and just enjoying it while it lasts. It's really when I heard one. that, I was like, this is like ne- Zach's next level. I was like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mine was... Uh, it's like a real quick one where she, he's talking to his secretary and they're just talking about how like how he's like so unhappy now that um, now that he, he might have this brain tumor and how he's should live his, all his life super unhappy. And she's like, I thought you're, all, you're always talking about how unhappy you are, though. I thought you're already unhappy. He's like, I was happy, but I didn't know I was happy. You bitch, and that was, was like, my quote. <laughs> that was like one of the funniest, but like also, it just, it's really hard hitting too, right? Yeah. Sorry if you're doing your quote, Caleb. No, that's okay. I have a whole bunch written down, so I'll pick a different one. But yeah, that was my quote. I was happy. I just didn't realize I was. And then, as an aside, I've already talked about it, but the don't knock my hobbies, and mm-hmm. this has to be done skillfully and diplomatically. And the other one that I didn't bring up yet was um, when they're talking about, like, how you're going to, basically, like, you're going to die eventually, and your, you know, your life is finite. And he says, uh, doesn't that just ruin everything for you? Which I thought was a pretty succinct way of putting yeah. his perspective. Like that. Okay. Um, favorite scene? Uh, you already know mine. Table <sighs> scene, dinner scene. So yeah, good. I gotta go with kind of cheating, but the chase scene in Stagecoach. It's a good one. We have some good scenes in this movie. Caleb. Mm, yeah, I would say chase scene. Obviously, that's cheating, but the spinning around scene is really good too. At dinner. Um, favorite character. Uh, Doc Boone. Too great. Yeah, that's probably mine too. I would say, um, Hatfield. Yeah. Oh, I really do like, like Lee as well. Sorry. Hatfield, yeah, Hat- Hatfield is also close, yeah. Now, this is a tough one, I think. Best performance. I'm gonna give it to Doc Boone, Mitchell as well. I, uh... it was just, I don't know. I just really enjoyed it. Ultimately, I enjoyed it the most. Caleb, you have yours, because I'm still not sure. Yeah, I was going to say Michael Caine, because he does, like, yeah. so many really subtle things to, like, display his hidden emotions. Like, for example, um, I'm like, as an aside, he's doing these things in a way that could very easily come off unnatural, but he managed to make them look, like, natural, which is hard because they're unnatural emotions. But, like, for example, when he's, like, sitting in the room with Lee, like, when he really has a crush on her, but he's, like, not overt mm-hmm. about it yet. And then all of a sudden, like, someone's, like, his wife comes in or something, and all of a sudden he, like, turns around very abruptly, like, he's, like, been caught in the middle of doing something bad. And it's, like, not that pronounced, but it's pretty subtle, and he manages to make it just, like, look really natural. I was impressed. I really liked Barbara Hershey as Lee, so I'm going to go with that one. Since I already gave the third character Dr. Boone, I'll give this one to her. Um, She's so good. It's, like, the whole dinner scene, and I'm keep harp keep talking about it but it's just so great if she's not in it it's just like it's a regular really good fight scene right there's <laughs> right we're just you know holly versus hannah they're both kind of getting everything out but what's so great is slowly she's like melts breaks down where like she has all this like inner turmoil 
And he kind of comes out like, stop being mean to Hannah. She didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And she's like, what are you talking? And they're, both of them are just so confused, but they're too busy fighting to really be confused. And you can just see that emotion build up on her face, and it's so brilliant. Yeah. And also the scene, like I said, the breakup scene with Frederick is amazing. And also just, she really sells like, you know, she's kind of like the early, you know, manic pixie dream girl, right? Yeah. So that was that such a cool movie. dynamic. That mm-hmm. was a very cool dynamic of like both Michael Hawkins' character and Lee, like, mm-hmm. are both, even though they're hurting her, they're both really protective of Hannah at the same time. Because mm-hmm. from their guilt and because they both just like really love her and don't want her to get hurt, it's like such an interesting. And because she's, she's such a good person, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um. Now we can your favorite movie. Derek, you already said yours. Give me um, Yeah, I need to finish because you cut me off. Um, I was going to say, I just enjoyed it more directorially and what it, uh, John Ford did directorially to enhance what it was already trying to say narratively with like, and creating all the tropes and whatnot and interesting things they were doing with the dynamics of the characters just really uh, like engaged me and uh, I just ended up enjoying it more. I respect that. And uh, I'm sorry for cutting you off earlier, Derek. No, that's fine. Really, it's Caleb's fault for not uh, asking me earlier why I was doing that technique first. Mm-hmm. My, I preferred uh, Hannah's Sisters. I just that movie really hit me home to me. Well, both the acting it's so great. It's just shot so well too. Like we only talk about that as much, but the whole like party scenes are all amazingly well done. The whole fight, yep. the fight with Lee and Frederick are just amazingly well done. Just how he kind of like how he navigates these spaces and Derek all about establishing like logical spaces. He's really good at doing that too. Um, it reminded me of early summer a lot. With like, mm-hmm. you would kind of like see there'd be like kind of two rooms, and like one of them would be like behind the other, and characters yeah. would go back and forth. With the tours and the- well, early summer is more about the front room, right? This mm-hmm. is all about the back room, which yeah. is like what makes the movie so brilliant. Um, so I'm gonna go with that one. Caleb, it's all on you. Uh, I'm gonna say Hannah and her sisters. Like you said, it hit me on a lot of levels, like on the artistic thing and the whole like stop worrying about life thing. And it was balanced really well between like and typical Woody Allen zaniness, and then also this other like kind of escapist uh, artistic side of things. And yeah, like you said, acted really well, and all that stuff. Stage coach was very good, uh, but I really really liked Hannah and her sisters. So, so Derek votes for the <laughs> not the winner once again. <laughs> Yeah, it's like y'all are uh, conspiring against me or something, or y'all have similar opinions or something. Hey, hey, hey. Um, I voted for the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie with you. It was the last time you two Oh, so, uh, so, barely. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I, I want to do the stats, run the stats again, Derek. I'm pretty sure it's like actually probably pretty even. Sure, Just run the like stats. A... Wait, well, I'm curious. Are there any times when it's me and Derek versus no. Matthew? <laughs> no, it never happened. <laughs> I didn't write this down. Did I, oh, um. Well, I lost on uh, Rosalini. Lost on Truffaut. But real quick, um, me and Derek both voted for the Elephant Man. Caleb, you voted for two things I know about her, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see. So, um, Caleb didn't have the Damned. We all ever fake girl, The Shining. Caleb didn't have Knights of Kiberia. Caleb didn't have Elephant Man. Um, Derek didn't have Godfather Part Three. Robert French can can. Caleb didn't have Cries and Whispers. Derek didn't have Throne of Blood. Uh, we all had um King of Comedy. We all had Early Summer. Um, Derek didn't have Exterminating Angel. Well, technically, you know, I kind of had that one with him. It was a close one for me. I ended up voting it in. Derek didn't have Monster of Rizzo. Um, Derek didn't have... Or Caleb didn't have Mouchette. Derek didn't have The Kid. Um, Derek didn't have Pilot of Shaklum. So it's, now it is... Wait, no, I put it against Mouchette. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, yeah, I changed that. Oh, okay. Um, so right now it is 7-6. to six. Caleb's inside with one more time than Derek has. So I need to calm down. That's pretty close. Yeah. No, but the fact that except for mine have been like the ones I like actually loved. Sorry, dude. Okay. You got, 
I love this movie. <laughs> to be fair. I loved the kid, and I thought Flowers was weak. I loved uh, Throne of Blood. I loved Monster Vado. That's not even get started on. Uh... <laughs> what was the one? The woman next door. <laughs> oh my! I'm gonna. <laughs> that was a better movie, though. That was, actually, not, that was not the better movie. movie. That was literally yes, it was. the dry dialogue, the acting, and the characters were all trash. Okay. Also comparing it to the private life of Sherlock Holmes, and that movie was like not good either. It was all right. <laughs> My thing is all the right, woman uh, next door was, it was bad. A lot of nothing. I thought you no, guys... I something I think it was like actually an explicitly bad movie. I don't I don't Dang. think it was like a bad. I think it was alright. What's up, Kill? Uh, I was gonna say like that's actually baffling that Matthew has never been the odd one out. I know. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> That's really strange. It's funny because the very first podcast we had was, uh, you know, The Shining versus Great Expectations. Like, I almost wrote for Great Expectations that one. And then I didn't. Wait, don't you typically put yourself last? It's probably, like, because of the way you do it. Like, if you're not sure, you usually just go last. Um, no, I usually put it because, I, I usually, if I put myself last, it's because I think I know what you two are doing. I feel like I've just, I'm not sure, but I feel like I've definitely heard you say something on the lines of, like, like if we both vote first, then you just will kind of, like, cut it short of, like, well. That was only ever really true for the sh- uh, Shining and Great Expectations. Like, French King Can, I definitely liked more. Um, Grapes of Wrath, obviously, I liked more. Because I did not like, uh, what's it called? Obviously, King of Comedy, I liked more. Um, Early Summer was versus, and that one was, I like, guess, kind of close, but I don't even know if I went last on that one. I think we all just like that. So, yeah, I mean. Those are the only ones we all agreed on. Oh, Passive Glory, also, obviously, I liked more. But that one, I didn't. I, no, what I usually do, Caleb, is if I know you two are going to disagree, I'll put you two first, right? That way yeah, I can that makes sense. Excited. And then lately, if I don't, if, like, I'll let one of you go, and, if, like, for instance, you can just kind of guess what Derek's going to do. <laughs> yeah. Like if, if I know I'm going to disagree with Derek, then I'll, like, let myself go second. That's usually. I see. All about suspense. Um... Yeah, with the thing is shining and great expectations though, I was like, uh, I really don't know. I'm super mixed. I'm just gonna go with you two in this one. But then ever since then, I, I you know, pretty much for the movie I thought was explicitly better, and it just happens that. Uh, wow, the, that's crazy. Yeah. Anyways, one day it'll happen. Maybe it'll happen in the grand finals. Uh, next time we're hype. watching Chimes of Midnight by Orson Welles, and A Clockwork Orange by Stanley Kubrick. I'm very excited. Caleb's already seen these movies. Mm-hmm. I don't go into the details there of why that might be, but uh, <laughs> I'm excited to watch them. But until next time, everyone, have a great night and uh, watch. More, remember to watch more movies. <laughs>